Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm joined for a second time by Dr. David C. Geary. He is Curator's Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychological Sciences at the University of Missouri. He's the author of several books and today we're going to talk about uh, male-female, the evolution of human sex differences, which recently came out in its third edition. So, Dr. Geary, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Okay, great. So, I mean, let's go back to the basics, I guess. How far mm -hmm. back in evolution do we need to go to understand where sex differences come from? Well, I, I think we have to go all the way back to the um, evolution of sexual reproduction. So we're going back uh, probably several billion years. Um, so we have to understand the, um, the, the benefits and costs of uh, sexual reproduction and why sexual reproduction is uh, the most common way of reproducing and why it generally um, produces healthier offspring than um, self-reproduction. Um, and, and then we also need to look at the evolution of um, sex cells, sperm and ova, uh, called anisogamy, and um, why that resulted in the evolution of um, just two sexes in the vast majority of um, species. So, yeah, the uh, bottom line there is that um, <clears throat> The evolution of sex provides uh, many benefits. Uh, it, it increases the diversity of the uh, genome of the uh, offspring, mm -hmm. which can have uh, benefits in terms of um, reducing uh, risks of infection and other sorts of things. It mixes up the immune system genes that in turn makes the offspring less vulnerable to parasites that have maybe adapted to their parents, creates a great greater phenotypic variability in offspring, brothers and sisters a little bit different or brothers are a little different from each other, um, which allows greater adaptation, potential adaptation to changes in the ecology across uh, generations. Um, if there's recessive genes that possibly are harmful to the individual. Uh, mixing up genes um, from mom and dad could suppression of the exposed genes. So there, there, there are many, many um, benefits to sexual re reproduction. And then we get um, to the evolution of uh, sexual gametes, uh, sperm and ova. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, if you're at the extreme, uh, you're at an advantage. So if it's sperm, you can generate lots and lots of them at relatively low cost, and, and each has a very small probability of uh, fertilizing an egg, but you have a lot of them, so you're, you're buying a lot of lottery tickets, so to speak, so your chances of, of winning are higher. And then the ova, the, the egg has the advantage of um, providing nutrients, so once uh, fertilization occurs, you have nutrients uh, there that can um, maintain the developing individual uh, before they hatch or before implantation or whatever, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about sex, how is sex defined from a biological or even evolutionary bi psychological perspective? I mean, is it through the chromosomes, the phenotypic traits, the sex hormones, all of them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there, there will be differences in sex chromosomes for uh, males and females across you know, species. Um, but very basically males have the smaller sex cells, the sperm, and the females have the larger cells, the, the eggs or the ova. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, how do we deal with people that have uh, conditions like, I mean, they are, they are intersexual people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, they are born with some sort of 
uh, developmental, I wouldn't want to say develop, uh, developmental issue, but I mean, sometimes their genitalia are not completely formed or are somewhat of the opposite sex. So mm -hmm. how should we deal with those people from an evolutionary perspective? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> so if, if we're looking at uh, mammals, uh, females are the default sex. So if there's no exposure to testosterone and related hormones prenatally, early postnatally, um, you know, the body type, body plan will be female. And to make it male, you have to kind of suppress aspects of the female body plan and increase uh, masculinized aspects of the uh, male body plan. And that occurs for different traits and different things at different times during prenatal development and sometimes early postnatal development. And if, um, you know, there is some differences in the timing of exposure to hormones, uh, especially for the physical sorts of things, it'd be early on in development or, um, you know, different sensitivities to these hormones, et cetera. You, you, you could um, develop sex organs that that would be common for both sexes and intersex individual doesn't doesn't actually occur very often one in every few thousand people mm -hmm. yeah i mean this is sort of a controversial question but because we have intersex people would mm -hmm. that mean that we should have uh, more than two categories for sex or not no, I, I think we should have two categories for sex. I mean, that is, sex is about reproduction, and you have males and females. They have uh, overlapping interests in, re in reproduction, and that's the, the primary unit for, for reproducing. If we had more than two sexes in, in mammals and people, then intersex would be much more common than, than it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, how important is sexual selection for us to understand how some uh, sexually dimorphic traits evolved? And perhaps some uh, would also include perhaps some psychological traits. Um, how important is it? Yeah, so, so se sexual selection involves um, essentially finding a mate. Once um, uh, sex you know, the two sexes evolved and sexual reproduction was, was um, necessary, then you have to find um, a mate. And sexual selection is the dynamics associated with that. So it would be competition with members of the same sex, so male-male competition or female-female competition, and then discriminating choices. You typically don't mate randomly, but you prefer one individual over uh, another. Um, typically... Uh, females are choosier, um, primarily because they, they invest more in parenting and males compete more. But, but you also get the reverse of that, where, where males can get choosy under some conditions and females compete. Um, in any case, uh, sexual selection is, is, is critical and probably drives the evolution of the vast majority of sex differences that we see um, across species. So if... Um, Males compete physically, you know, they beat on each other for access to status, um, which will in, in influence mating opportunities, control of nesting sites that females need or whatever. If there's a physical competition, bigger, more aggressive males typically will have an advantage over their smaller, more do docile peers um, and therefore will reproduce more. Uh, their offspring will be bigger and more aggressive than the previous generation and then, then you just repeat that cycle over and over again and you get bigger males um, due to male-male competition and that competition in turn um, creates a sex difference in physical size and, and aggression in this mm -hmm. case. Mm -hmm. So how should we think about the connection between the evolution of some uh, sexually dimorphic physical traits mm 
and psychological ones? I mean, what's the connection there? Right. So the um, the physical sex differences are easy to see, and their relation to reproductive opportunities has has been verified in a number of um, species. But but the same process can also affect uh, behaviors, cognitions, psychological biases for uh, people. Um, the same process is, does it give you an advantage in terms of male-male competition or um, female choice, uh, for example? So, so bird song is a good example. It's a brain and cognitive. The, the brain networks involved in bird song are well understood. Um, they're very sensitive to testosterone levels. And um, it has two components. One component is to attract females. Uh, the, the, the bird song is, is primarily in males. And the other component is kind of a territorial sorts of things. It's signaling the male's fitness or health to other birds. So in that case, rather than the males being physically a lot bigger than the females, um, be, we, we, we don't see that as much be, because they're not physically fighting as much. Typically, um, we have a brain network that is larger, sometimes considerably larger in males than females, and that supports the underlying kind of um, behavioral or bird song competition. Mm -hmm. By the way, you touched on the point on my previous question when you said that um, we tend to think that males compete and females choose, but there's mate choice on both sides of the aisle, I guess. So would you, would you agree that maybe the mutual mate choice model is the best one to explain uh, how sexual selection works in humans and perhaps other species? Yeah, so in, in, in some species, there, there is mutual mate choice where both the males and the females kind of sort. They, they pick, uh, you know, they, they pair up based on whatever criteria they're using, maybe a plumage color or whatever. Um, and, and in that case, you often get female-female competition and male-male competition along with mutual mate choice. Um, for, for humans... <clears throat> Um, I, I think ev everything is involved. Uh, there's clearly male-male competition because uh, if it wasn't important during our evolutionary history, male is, males and females would be about the same size physically, same amount of lean muscle mass and other things, which isn't, <clears throat> isn't the case. Um, we clearly know that both males, uh, men and women, have preferences when they choose mates and so there is some mutual mate choice going on there um and females can be quite competitive with one another especially if there aren't that many high status males around competition for, for attracting those males goes up and in uh, polygamous societies uh you might have two or three or four women married to the same guy and there's often intense competition among the co-wives for his attention uh, for them and his investment in their kids. Mm -hmm. By the way, can we say that we have um, a main mating system in our species? I mean, in terms of us being polygynous, polyandrous, uh, uh, monogamous, or something like that? Right. So a lot of debates. Uh, humans show a lot of variability. Uh, you can see polygony where a man would have multiple wives in a lot of traditional societies, about 85% of them. It's, so it's more common than, than not. Um, polyandry where a woman has two husbands is less common, but it does occur. Um, and then a lot of people in a lot of different societies are monogamous. But I think in terms of our evolutionary history, um, the pattern has been uh, polygamy, with the dominant males having, um, you know, at least a few wives. Uh, some other males having being monogamous, and a lot of males kind of being cut out of the reproductive pool. We see evidence for that in um, <clears throat> the sex difference in physical size. 
So in primates, uh, when you have a polygonous system, the males are bigger and more aggressive than females, which obviously fits with us and fits with people going back uh, at least four million years for our ancestors. It's, it's the case as well. Um, the population genetic studies show that we have more female than male ancestors, which means that the male ancestors, uh, if, if it was reproductive skew, um, you know, the higher status or higher successful ones, however that was achieved, had more wives and offspring, and a lot of male lineages disappeared, um, which, which is consistent with a, a polygonous system. And as I said, in um, traditional cultures, uh, polygony is the norm, where 10 or 20 percent of the guys will have more than one wife. Mm -hmm. But these polygynous systems, let's say, I mean, there's only a minority of men that are able to have more than one wife, correct? Right, right. Yeah, so that's in um, traditional cultures. So it might be two or three or four, four wives, um, but not huge numbers. Um, during the emergence of early empires, so, you know, yeah, three, four, five thousand years ago, thousand years ago, um, there was huge reproductive skew where the dominant males had many, many, many wives. And a lot of the other males, you know, if they lost the war, were uh, killed off or kept as slaves or whatever. So it, it, it's varied across cultures and historically the extent of it. Mm -hmm. Does it have anything to do with sex ratios or, or at least sex ratios would influence the way males and females compete intersexually and intersexually and cooperate? I don't know. Right. So, so even with, with the history of polygamy, intense male-male competition, female choice was kind of like the bias. Um, <clears throat> You know, the here and now expression of sex differences depends on context, uh, cultural rules for marriage, other sorts of things. One, one of the things that influence it, influences it is called the uh, operational sex ratio. Mm -hmm. So the number of um, men looking for a wife and the number of women looking for a husband. And so if those are out of balance, then the... Um, Sex that is, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, in in demand. So so there's fewer of them have um, advantages in terms of lever leveraging dynamics. So if there are, um, you know, 120 women looking for husbands and 90 or 100 men looking for wives or mates or whatever, there's fewer men than women. And so those men are better able to express their preferences. And during those historical periods, we see um, more casual sex, uh, more liberal sexual mores. So it's okay for both men and women to have multiple partners. Um, delayed marriage in men, less men, male investment in offspring, um, <clears throat> uh, more single parent households, so forth. So, so men are better able to express their preference for casual, uncommitted sex. Oh, of course, some men get married. Now, if we flip that over and there's more men than women, then women have more choices and they're better able to um, exert their preferences. And in those contexts, uh, we see more stable monogamous marriages, more two-family um, households, men invest more in kids and the relationship, they don't cheat, um, so forth. So that's just, you know, independent of any evolved biases, the kind of preference uh, expression varies across contexts, including the operational sex ratio. Mm -hmm. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that in the case of humans at least, uh, parents have um, a big a big influence on uh, 
uh, their offspring uh, mate choices? So, I mean, is it the case that they are usually aligned? I mean, do they are they aligned with the mate preferences for men and women that we see in our species? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in traditional societies, hunter-gatherer societies, agricultural or cultural societies, most of the uh, choosing of a spouse is done by parents or a wider kin network. So the, the kind of free choice, find your own guy or girl sort of thing that, that we're used to um, isn't the norm in traditional cultures. And so the adults around um, kind of make those choices for sons, but especially for daughters, um, you know, and, and sometimes the interests align, you know, what the guy that the, um, that the parents choose is the same guy the woman would want or, or would be happy with. And, and other times there, there's a conflict of interest, um, because the parents and parents' family often receives some, uh, what's called bride price, some resources from the groom and his family or a bride service where the groom goes and works for them for a while. So th there's often conflict there. Um, but despite that, there, there, is, there, there are some similarities. And um, whether the parents or wider kin are choosing the spouse, the, the groom in this, in this case, or the woman is, there's a preference for guys who are higher status. I mean, more culturally successful, they have more control over culturally important resources, cows, um, goats, or income, whatever it might be, arable land, and they have social influence. And so these guys are much more likely to be picked either by parents or the woman herself than less successful guys. Mm -hmm. So earlier you said at a certain point that culture also influences a little bit mate preferences, uh, mm -hmm. but to what extent? Because I guess that when we talk about culture and our evolved psychology, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. That is, I mean, perhaps uh, at least certain times the kinds of preferences that we see expressed culturally come from our evolved psychology and not the other way around, right? Right. So, right, yeah. So which, which came first? My, my, my interpretation of it is that uh, the evolved biases came first because we can trace at least some of them back to other primates and, and likely our, our evolutionary history. Um, and that social and cultural influences kind of modify their expression to some extent. So we can look at um, uh, human universals. So you can look at um, you know, what women prefer in men and whether that's the same across cultures um, and then there's aspects of their preferences that might vary across cultures. And so we see both universal preferences. So women prefer successful men. The less successful men is a very consistent sort of thing. And men prefer um, younger, more attractive women to other women is a universal thing as well. Um, but then there's other things like... Um, how compatible, you know, how much can we talk together, develop an intimate relationship, you know, between a husband and a wife, how important that is varies a little bit across cultures, depending on, on circumstances and a, a variety of other things. Mm -hmm. And those preferences work both for long-term and short-term mating, or do they vary a little bit? Yeah, th those preferences across cultures or... Um, yes, across uh, cultures, in terms of the human universals. Yeah, the, well, yeah, the universals, I think, are, are going to be the same for short term and long term. A lot of, you know, so if, if we look at uh, short term preferences in women, so they're going to have uh, a short relationship with a guy. And if they are going to have a relationship, what are the characteristics they prefer in that guy. And then we look at, okay, so what are the characteristics they prefer in a longer term relationship? 
Um, for the majority of women, they're, they're, they're pretty much the same. They're, they're kind of related uh, to one, one another. And so some of the short-term relationships that, that women engage in may be um, attempts to develop a longer-term relationship. Mm -hmm. Could we say that from an evolutionary perspective, males would prefer short-term mating and females long-term mating because of issues regarding perhaps, I, I think that we could include in the picture things like paternity uncertainty and the levels of parental investment and also the fact that due to the differences in terms of their gametes, I mean, it would, it would be an optimal strategy for men to try to impregnate as many women as they can and not the same for women. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so that's a, a common uh, question. And it is true in some cases where the males are just focused on, um, you know, having as many mates as they can get and no parental investment. And from a straight genetic point of view, that makes that makes sense. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it's much more complicated in people, though, because males do have some level of parental investment. Um, and I suspect that that male investment, probably protection of offspring, uh, has a pretty long evolutionary history, although I think other, other folks might um, disagree with that. But in any case, um, so if, if we have male uh, investment in offspring, so we have some paternal sort of thing, and polygyny, where the males would have several um, uh, mates, say three or four or whatever, um, I think you would get some of the same patterns that, that we see in the social psychological literature, but maybe for different reasons. And so, for example, there is a um, sex difference in uh, preference for sexual variety, where, where men are more interested in, in having you know, a variety of, of mates than women are. And that is um, often interpreted as a preference for uncommitted short-term sex. Yeah. And I think that's true. I mean, there, there, there would clearly be potential reproductive benefits for that. Um, although in traditional contexts, I don't know how easy it would be to achieve because everybody knows each other and they monitor things and stuff. But so it, it, it could evolve in any case for that reason. Um, that preference could also evolve uh, if there's an evolutionary history of polygamy, where the preference for variety is not so much focused on short term mating, but having several long term mates. So in um, you know, a modern context where we don't have polygamy, that might be the guy has um, you know several marriages in a row, or is married and has a long-term affair. Mm -hmm. So there's sexual variety there, but it's not a lot of short-term types of things. And and, and I think um, both of those are, are more common. You know, the longer-term affair rather than just having a lot of short-term sex. Although cl clearly that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, in the, in my last question, I referred to paternity uncertainty. Are mm -hmm. there ways of increasing paternity certainty for men in Homo sapiens? Yeah, um, what's what's interesting is that if we look at chim uh, so so paternity certainty, if the male is going to make some type of investment in offspring. Um, male investment could only evolve if he's actually investing in his own offspring. So there has to be some certainty that he is in fact the father. And so if, if we look at chimpanzees um, and bonobos that are, that are closely related to us, um, there's no paternity certainty. Uh, the, the females are promiscuous and um, nobody's really sure who the dad is. Uh, if we look, go a little kind of more distant cousin and look at gorillas, 
we have um, about a 95% paternity certainty. We see gorilla family units with a dominant male, um, maybe three or so, three or four, I think, is, is the, the median uh, females and their offspring. And the, the males hang out with the offspring a lot of times. The offspring climb on them and they, they play together. And the male protects them from infanticidal extra group males. And so there we have high levels of parental uh, paternal investment and high levels of paternity certainty, okay? Mm -hmm. And then if we look at human groups, uh, we do DNA fingerprinting and other sorts of measures to say, okay, you know, how certain is paternity uh, for, for men? And in modern context, it's very high. It's um, 97% or more. So cheating is not that common, cuckolding, you know, where the, the woman has sex with some other guy and it tricks her husband into raising his, this other guy's kid is pretty uncommon. Some recent studies going back looking at um, uh, Y DNA lineages and last names also suggest historically going back, you know, 500 or more years that um, paternity certainty has been very high in, in, in European context where, where it's been been studied. Uh, paternity certainty is probably a little bit lower in traditional contexts, um, and there's not really a great study of you know how certain things are. But I I, I would guess it's it's probably greater than ninety percent in most cases, and you have um, you know male investment in mo most of those those cases. So men invest. Uh, much more in offspring than we would predict if our ancestors were like chimpanzees. Um, their paternity certainty is much higher than we would predict if our ancestors were like chimpanzees. But if our ancestors were like gorillas, um, dominant male, say three, um, three females and their offspring, that, you know, this extended family unit, uh, paternity certainty is high, male interest in more than one mate is there it's evolved but it's not a short-term mating thing it is part of a polygonous mating strategy and we take those gorilla groups and we put a bunch of them together and and we have a, a traditional village so the we, we we're very similar to um gorillas in, in a number of ways including high levels of paternity certainty mm -hmm. that's very interesting but gorillas have it's, uh, groups or troops where it's one male and multiple females, right? And in the case of human societies, it's right. multi-male, multi-female. Right, right. So, um, right. So one of the things that, that makes us more similar to chimpanzees is the male coalitional competition. So groups of male chimpanzees will get together and they'll raid or try to ambush males from the adjacent group and kill him and eventually expand their territory, um, which is why a lot of um, evolutionists like the chimpanzee model, because that component is clearly similar to what we see in men. Um, but, but if we take the gorilla model and say, okay, all we need to do is increase the bonds between the males uh, to form male coalitions, then everything else is set. The family units, the male investment, the males and females have long-term relationships. And um, if we look at uh, lowland wet western gorillas, the, um, the uh, family groups are not as isolated as there are mountain gorillas. And the males are actually fairly tolerant of one another. Um, it turns out because they're related. They're, they're often brothers or father, son types of things. Um, and so they're just one step away from forming coalitions that would give us, and once they started forming coalitions, we'd have our multi-male, multi-female groups. And, and some gorilla groups actually do have more than one, one male. Mm -hmm. So changing topics now, I would like to talk a little bit about development. So 
what is the earliest stage where we're already able to see some sex differences in humans, in human infants in this case? Yeah, so um, differences are evident before implantation. So a fertilized um, ova that, that will become male has um, higher metabolic rates than one that will become a female. Um, and, and there are um, differences in, in prenatal development. The males are, are developing more slowly than the females as part of a general uh, life history different, uh, di uh, sex difference. There are now um, studies that are able to do brain imaging work in utero. So you can get the mom in and you do, do the scanner when the fetus is six months old and you can begin to look at um, patterns of activation within the cortex. So you look at what areas are active simultaneously, suggesting they have kind of a functional integration with them, and you can look at systems, network systems and stuff. And um, one, it, it's clear, you know, there's a lot of brain development going on. And there are some early studies suggesting that um, some of these uh, patterns of connectivity are different in uh, boys and girls, uh, you know, six months in utero during prenatal development. But, but, but those are very recent and early studies. So, so we'll, we'll need to see more of those. Um, once the kids are born, uh, we begin to see some differences in the first day of life. Uh, these tend to be pretty small and get bigger in adolescence. And, and generally across, there's a lot of misconception about that. A lot of psychologists and, and people generally believe that if there are biological influences on sex differences, they should be evident very early in life, before any potential socialization. And that later in life, you know, as we get into adolescence and so forth, um, differences should be due to socialization because you, you know, you've had 15 years or whatever, you know, hanging out with mom and dad, peers, watching TV or whatever the socialization might be. Um, but Dar Darwin pointed out 150 years ago that if we look at development across species, um, males and females are pretty similar early in development. Mm -hmm and become increasingly different as they approach reproductive maturation. So we would expect sex differences to be smaller in people early on in life, relatively small during childhood, and then become exaggerated during adolescence. That, that would be the general plan that we, uh, pattern that we see across species. And, and, and that's exactly what, what we see here. But, but, but that said, um, we still do see some early sex differences. Um, girls, in, infant girls make eye contact, um, I don't know, more frequently, but they maintain eye contact more than um, infant boys do. And that's evident um, within the first 24 hours, of, you know, the first day of life. Um, some in, interesting studies looking at, again, in the, in the first day, first 28 to, 24 to 48 hours, um, girls show a preference for looking at faces, boys a preference for looking at kind of moving objects. Um, there are small differences, um, but they, those biases become bigger as um, kids get older. Mm -hmm. but by the way, is that difference the one point of uh, by Simon Baron Cohen when he distinguishes between being interested in people versus being interested in things or the empathizers versus the systemizers, systematizers, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's related to that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it is... Um, Exactly what 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 um, Simon says. I mean, he 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 does great work, and and I like his distinction there. But but I think there's a little bit more to it. Um, the systematizing that he talks about 
is is items you know like you like to work on gadgets you like to think about how you know uh, an engine works and you mentalize how it works rather than how people work uh, and so forth but 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 there's no you know there's no engines in our evolutionary history um, so I think what you know the, this early sex differences looking at faces versus things um, is picking up on a bias in what's called the um, dorsal and ventral visual streams so the do the dorsal stream you know, you're looking at space and it's kind of going up to this part of the brain. And so you just have attentional bias there. And that focus you as, focus, focuses you on large-scale space and the move, non-biological movement in space. So an object moving in space kind of captures um, that uh, bias. And, and so I think that, that that's why the mobile thing there. Uh, so boys have that bias. Girls have a ventral stream bias where they're focusing more on the details of what they're looking at, especially the faces. So they're looking at the eyes, configuration of the eyes, nose, and kind of the, the T, the central part of the face. And, and guys have a more kind of um, broader scale focus. Mm -hmm. Does that have also something to do with type references? And I mean, there are, there are also some studies that people done on other primates, chimps maybe, where um, females tended to pick toys that looked more like people and males tended to pick toys like trucks and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there have been a couple of studies now that have looked at uh, toy preferences in um, uh, a couple of species of uh, monkey. Um, kind of seeing if the same toy preferences we see seeing kids are like a um, animal uh, to the you know in the in the cage area and you know big truck that moves kind of back and forth and you see okay who prefers what uh, and and the males are a little, little more curious or less fearful with this new stuff and so, so they engage with both a little bit more but if you look at preferences when there's engagement, uh, the females like the doll, you know, the the stuffed animal holding that kind of kind of like an infant, and the males play more with the um, the trucks, and and again, no no um, evolutionary history of trucks for humans or um, these monkey species, but the non biological movement is picking up the sensitivity of this dorsal stream. So if you, you're more focused on large-scale space and things moving in that space, those types of toys will be more interesting to you. Mm -hmm. uh, is play behavior and perhaps the kinds of groups that boys and girls establish among themselves important for the development of sex-typical behavior, or is it more innate, let's say? Well, I think I think it's both. Um, what's interesting with kids is that um, starting at about three or so, and especially when they move into the elementary school years, um, they really segregate. So you have a boys' culture and a girls' culture, and of course they may play together at times, but they spend the majority of their time interacting with um, individuals of the same sex, and so they're learning. Um, how to work with, compete with, integrate with socially um, members of the same sex. So there is a kind of a socialization component to it, um, but it's a, a child-driven component. They create their own worlds and then they learn to deal with um, each other, you know, at least in the same sex, in the context of that, those social experiences. And, and that is... Um, similar to what, what we find in traditional cultures, we have very sex-typed activities in adulthood. The guys do this, and the women do this, and it's kind of separate. It's not integrated as much as, as we see in modern cultures. And the kids' natural play activities kind of mirror that segregation. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So in the book, you also mention at a certain point some studies that people done where they basically observe that uh, uh, girls and boys tend to imitate traditional female and male sex typical behaviors, whether they are enacted by men or women. Could you tell us about that? Right. So, um, you know, boys, <clears throat> boys and girls play behaviors that are, are actually very different. The, the difference there is, is pretty large. So things like rough and tumble play, interest in dolls and so forth, and a lot of other things um, vary quite a bit in boys and girls. And in the um, 60s and 70s, uh, when social learning theory was d developing in psychology, the belief was that, well, they're imitating um, older kids and parents and therefore learning sex typical behaviors in that way. Um, <clears throat> and there's been actually scores of studies, 70, 80 more, that have looked at kids' imitation of sex typical behaviors. And what they find is that kids do imitate, you know, if they see an adult, you know, if boys see an adult kind of rough housing with something, um, they'll increase their rough housing behavior. Um, but it does rough housing, doing it, doing it, they'll increase it. Um, but if they see dad doing a female typical behavior, kind of playing house or whatever, they don't increase in that behavior. So it's not a direct um, uh, imitation of what mom's doing or what dad's doing or what they see on TV or whatever. It is an increase in activities that they uh, think are interesting that captures their attention. Mm -hmm. that, that's very interesting. So um, let's talk about some other sex differences. And because you've done work on core knowledge or full cognition, mm -hmm. are there mm -hmm. any major sex differences when it comes to folk psychology, folk biology and folk physics? Yeah. So traditionally in psychology, um, sex differences have been, cognitive sex differences have been studied in terms of, um, you know, verbal, quantitative, like mass sorts of things, and spatial. Um, and, and I cover those in the book, but I'm less interested in some of them at least. So if we look at mathematics, you know, there's a small sex difference, but there's no mathematics in traditional societies and there's no reading and writing in traditional societies. So they're not those types of differences aren't as interesting. But if you look at universal um, cognitive skills, core knowledge or folk abilities, um, like uh, language, theory of mind, the sensitivity to facial expressions, the ability to read gestures, body posture, the ability to navigate and so forth. Um, you do see sex differences that, that are interesting and um, appear to be universal. So one component of folk psychology is the ability to uh, do dyadic interactions, interact one-on-one -on -one with somebody and be able to follow the conversation, read nonverbal cues, kind of get an idea of what they're thinking or feeling or whatever. Um, and those skills are also important for developing one-on-one -on -one intense dyadic socially supportive relationships and um, girls and women tend to do better on all of those so if you look at things like language fluency the grammatical structure of their utterances sensitivity to um, changes in facial expression you know reading emotions from faces um, theory of mind ability to kind of make inferences about what you know, so-and-so is feeling at the time and so forth. Um, girls and women have advantages in most of those areas. In each individual area, it's, um, you know, small to moderate advantage. But if we put them all together, which is what would happen if you're actually interacting with somebody, um, it's actually a pr pretty big, pretty big difference where four out of five girls are better than the average guy.
And I guess some people call that emotional intelligence. Yeah. Um, guys primarily have advantages in what's called folk physics. So this would be um, the ability to spatially navigate, so to get from one place to another, especially using, without the use of landmarks, kind of developing a bird's eye view of kind of large scale space and navigating from A to B, knowing A is east of B and you have to go west to get to, to where, where you need to go to. Um, the ability to mentally represent visual spatial types of things to generate images and rotate them, generate uh, geographically accurate maps is better in guys. Um, mechanical reasoning and um, kind of an intuitive understanding of tools is better for guys. And in, a, in traditional contexts, um, guys have larger travel ranges than girls do. Um, sometimes for trading with other villages, sometimes for warfare with other villages, sometimes for hunting, you know, you have to take more space. So a lot of reasons for that, but the, the ranges are two to three times larger or more in men than women in traditional societies. Most of the tool use, tool construction is done by men in traditional societies. A lot of it is weapon construction. Uh, and, and so we, we see, not surprisingly, men have advantages in those areas. Mm -hmm. Do these differences translate into sex differences in education and educational attainment? I mean, are there areas of education where uh, it's easier for boys to learn about those kinds of subjects and others for girls or, or not? Yeah, I, I, I think so. So I think these folk abilities are kind of the foundation for uh, learning in school. So the language system and learning to read and write are very tightly related. So, so the brain areas associated with language production and comprehension are the primary areas involved in uh, core aspects of reading and writing. So it's like education is kind of, kind of built on top of this evolved system and, and integrated it with other systems. Um, so girls, as, as I mentioned, have uh, advantages in some aspects of language. <clears throat> and their advantages in aspects of language give them advantages in early reading, so on phonemic awareness, or, uh, explicit awareness of um, the language sounds that go with uh, letters, ka, ba, da, which is important for word decoding when you're first learning uh, to read. Um, girls also have an advantage in theory of mind, so kind of what other people are thinking uh, and feeling, and a lot of stories that involve characters, relationship development, and so forth. Um, if you're going to understand what's going on, you have to have a pretty good theory of mind to understand the, the social dynamics of what's um, being read. So the the um, some of the folk psychology advantages that girls and women have give them advantages uh, in reading and writing. Uh, they're not huge differences, but they're very, very consistent. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> there are other areas where men's advantage in spatial abilities may give them um, an advantage. Um, some areas of mathematics, not all of it. Um, if you're able to kind of diagram out mathematical relations, understand how things plot in space and so forth, um, having good visual spatial skills or a bias to solve problems with visual spatial strategies um, provides an, an advantage, probably engineering and men's advantage, mechanical reasoning and so forth. Um, all of that is, is related when you combine it with education. Mm -hmm. What about occupational attainment? Uh, do these differences also have some influence on, I mean, on the fact that women tend to choose certain occupations and men others, and perhaps also things like the gender pay gap? Yeah, yeah, good question. Of course, people get very uptight about this and a lot of debate about it. Um, yeah, I think that um, there's cl clearly uh, sex differences in um, 
uh, kind of segregation across different occupations. Women are more likely to go into occupations that involve dealing with living things, especially people, but also just live, living things generally, a lot like vet, veterinary medicine. Um, and there are <clears throat> um, more comfortable with um, occupations involved directly helping people, interacting with them, being a physician, a nurse, a teacher, or whatever, and where there is um, kind of e some level of equality in in the dynamics of the relationship. So working for a um, charity foundation or something like that, rather than a, you know, a high stress business type of thing. Um, <clears throat> when you see said se uh, segregation, men, men are more likely to go into occupations that involve inorganic things. So um, that can be anywhere from construction, um, you know, uh, you know, electrical wiring of a house or whatever to engineering, computer science, physics, and so forth. All of those occupations from very high status to, you know, moderate status ones um, attract more males than females. And, and, and I think those relate to the differences in folk psychology and folk physics and the um, preferences the psychological, social, and emotional preferences that go along with those differences. Mm -hmm. What about the gender equality paradox? I mean, people recently, researchers found out this paradox where basically it seems that in countries with higher levels of gender equality, there are certain differences that get more pronounced, like, for example, in education, in professional occupations, uh, and even some personality traits. So would there be any explanation for that? Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, par the par paradox is really interesting. So a, a social, cultural, sex differences or socialized view of things um, which, which has been popular for um, as long as people have been studying sex differences, you know, 120 plus years for psychologists. Um, the prediction was in the 70s was that as um, opportunities increased for women and um, you know access to uh, jobs, equalized education, political office, and so forth, as everything became more equal, then sex differences and things like personality, occupational choices, other sorts of things would essentially get smaller and smaller and disappear. That that was a prediction. And if you think everything is socialized, then then that follows logically from that um, from that 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 prediction follows logically from that model. However, um, that hasn't happened. Um, what has happened in, in many areas is that as countries become wealthier, more liberal, more gender equal in terms of access to education, occupations, jobs, so forth, um, many sex differences are actually become larger. Uh, so personality differences are larger. Um, a colleague and I, uh, Hesbert Stoet, found that as countries became more gender equal, the segregation, occupational segregation actually got larger. You had proportionally fewer and fewer women going into computer science, engineering, um, and so forth. So our, our explanation for that is that um, a lot of uh, inherent biases and preferences, not only sex differences, but individual personal ones as well, as, you know, life gets um, easier as social safety nets are put into place and you know there's a lot of different jobs and economic niches in the world so you have more, more options in life and as you have more options in life your individual preferences are better able to be expressed and so you see an expansion of individual differences and in preferences um, including sex differences so in, in, in the old days, there used to be three television channels, at least in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And so 
you know, you had some variation in choice in what you watched at night if you watched um, TV, but there wasn't much there. But, you know, you, you could still pick up some variation. Now, you know, if you have full cable, there's, you know, 200 or plus or more channels. And you see people kind of um, choosing, you know, a subset of, you know, some people might watch sports, others might watch kick cooking, you know, home sorts of things. Others might watch, you know, detective shows or whatever it is they're interested in. You get this wider variation. And you can only pick up on those differences when those options are there. You would never know they existed uh, if there weren't 200 television channels. When you only had three, you never picked up on them. So I, I think it's a similar similar type of thing as as life gets easier and opportunities expand, a lot of these more basic differences are more fully expressed. Mm -hmm. So could we say then that as we remove some environmental, social, cultural obstacles, let's say, that it's easier for men and women to express their innate proclivities in terms of their preferences and so on. Yeah, that that's what I think. Um, you know, other people would would disagree with it, but but yeah, I think that's exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, earlier when we were talking about human universals, just to clarify the concept, uh, does a human universal have to occur? in all cultures that we've studied, all societies, or does it only have to occur in the majority of them? How does it work exactly? Yeah, um, typically they, they occur in all societies in which they've been studied. Um, if there are exceptions, and, and usually there aren't, uh, there might be something unusual about the dynamics in that culture, but 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 the, there are certain things that are just universal. So men's preference for um, physical attractiveness in a spouse, for example, is, is the sex difference there, and the importance of that is universal. Um, the weighting of uh, social status is is universal as well. Women weight it higher than men do. It's not necessarily that men don't care, but it's it's less important to them sex difference in physical size is universal, although the magnitude of it can vary from one culture to the next, depending on nutrition, health care, other types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, sometimes people use modern hunter-gatherers as models for ancient societies of hunter-gatherers we evolved in. Uh, do we know to what extent they are good models of those more ancient societies? I mean, because there could be some important differences, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, we we don't know for sure. And it's certainly the case that contact with um, the West and other, other cultures has changed behavior among hunter-gatherers. Um, you know, with, with more contact, uh, level of violence, goes down, um, level of polygamy goes down. So there's kind of a imposition of kind of Western values onto those societies, which, which changes them, them a bit. I think if we look at um, the dynamics in these societies during the early phases, you know, when they were initially being studied, not three or four generations later, that, that might get us a little bit closer to what our ancestors were like. I mean, and of course, there, there, there's a lot of human history there, um, even in Western world or um, in China. There, there's a lot of history as well, and there's a lot of commonalities um, across these developing nations as well as with traditional societies, such as intense male-male competition. Yeah, so there are people that uh, fall more on the socializing side of things here and they say that, for example, uh, when they are trying to discredit these human sex differences, they say that there are some societies where there, there are more than two uh, 
genders? I mean, I mean, is that true and does it matter? Well, yeah, I mean, there are some societies that kind of have different names for more than two um, sexes. But what they're typically talking about are things like um, effeminate men. So they're still males, but they have um, female typical behaviors and um, interests or uh, more masculine females. So they have more male typical behaviors and um, interests and, and they kind of get a different name, but they're still males and females are just, you know, with men or any trait, uh, aggressiveness, extroversion, whatever, you're still going to get a normal distribution there. And you'll have a combination of traits that will put some guys more, the combination, put them more toward a female typical sort of thing. And women put them more toward a male typical sort of thing. But biologically, they're still males and females. They're, they're just distinguished as being, um, you know, kind of a different social category. But, the, but they're not a different biological category. Mm -hmm. Do you think that from a scientific perspective it makes sense to distinguish between sex and gender? Gender in this case meaning the sort of biological, uh, not biological, sorry, the behavioral slash psychological differences between men and women? Yeah, I, I don't really like the term gender and I try to avoid it as much as I can. Sometimes I have it in publications because that's what the journal prefers or the editor or whatever. But I think it, I think it just confuses things. I, I think it was an attempt, well, I mean, historically, it was thought that sex typical behaviors were socialized largely yeah. and that you could take a boy and raise him like a girl and he would become like a girl and there are some unfortunate examples of that where you know the, the penis was accidentally removed early on or whatever and there or or there, there there are some pelvic malformations that require surgery and it's easier to make a girl um, genitalia than boy genitalia so they they do that and so that happens early on in life and they're raised as in this case girls in the early belief, early belief meaning you know going back 70 years or so, was that well you just raise them as a girl and they'll just become girls, and so that's kind of where the gender comes from. Well, they were born boys, but we're going to socialize them as girls, and so the, there's a separation of the gender and the biological sex. Um, and, and it turns out it doesn't work that way. That the biological sex, the natal sex. Um, the prenatal and early postnatal hormones that go with it cause a lot of the sex differences in, say, uh, play preferences, toy preferences, um, social preferences, rough and tumble play, or so forth. These, these, these are related to hormonal um, mechanisms, and they're not caused by gender role stereotypes. The stereotypes themselves are just people noticing their differences. And then they think the description of these differences are somehow causing them. Um, and, and they have it completely backwards. Um, it, it just, um, I think, the political, social political uh, goal of using gender rather than sex is to confuse people um, and to create the belief that we can make everybody the same if we just change the narrative. Um, and, and this is nonsense, it's just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I, I get reminded of that tragic story. I think the name of the guy was David Reimer back in the mm -hmm. 70s or 80s, where he, he was born with some sort of intersex condition and he was basically biologically a male, but they tried to socialize him uh, as a female, but then, I mean, there were lots of problems and he ended up committing suicide. Right, right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think there are a number of complications in that case. Um, but there, there are other examples of that. He, he, he is, his is not the only example where attempts to, you know, make a male genitalia into female genitalia for whatever reason, socializes girls. It just doesn't work. 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, another question. Uh, ca can we learn more about human sex differences by studying different sexual orientations? Um, yeah, I, I, I think so. So we have, um, you know, people, even though there's two sexes, uh, you know, the male and the female, there's variation in traits, you know, how, um, you know, how interesting rough and tumble play is. A lot of boys like it, but, but some don't, and a lot of girls don't like it, but some do. So there's overlapping um, distributions there. Um, and there is, um, there can be within sex differences in sexual attraction. So most males, you know, 98% or so, 97% are attracted to women, but some will be attracted to guys and, and then vice versa for, for females. And, and, and so there, you know, it's heterosexuality is the norm, but also homosexuality is not uncommon. Um, and the, the reasons, the biological reason for it, the evolutionary social reason for it aren't, aren't totally, um, understood at this point, although I go through a number of theories in the book. Um, but they, but they do tell us something about, um, sex differences in heterosexuals, for example. So if we look at, um, the sexual behavior and sexual preferences of, um, homosexual males, they have more variety, they have more partners, they have more sex with a lot of guys um, than heterosexual males do or, or, or lesbians do. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting because heterosexual guys you know, prefer more variety and so forth than women do, um, but, but they have to deal with the preferences of women. And the preferences of the women they're with is monogamy, and so there's constraints there. But you have two guys together, um, those constraints, of the women's preferences are removed, and so you have a fuller expression of what, what males like. And, and you see much more um, sexual variety there. And in um, homosexual pairs, uh, the tolerance for extra pair relationships, say having two you know, you the primary couple, the two guys, primary couple, and then each or one of them having a secondary relationship. Uh, it's much more common among them than among heterosexual couples or lesbian couples. Mm -hmm. So what about a consensual non-monogamous relationships? I mean, nowadays there are people that at least they say they are polyamorous. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, do we know if there's any evolutionary explanation for that? Yeah, yeah. So po polyamorous is, is kind of a thing now. It's about 5% of people in relationships engage in that. We'll have a primary relationship, primary sexual relationship, and emotional, whatever it is, and then a secondary relationship. So they're basically um, practicing polygamy or polyandry depending on whether it's so these polyamorous things are kind of common across societies. It just seems unusual to us because we live in a society with social imposed monogamy where you're supposed to kind of stay within one relationship, then you have variations of it. Um, but in any case, it, it's pretty rare among heterosexual couples. Maybe um, I don't remember exactly, but it's less than 5%, maybe 3%. Or so is pretty rare among lesbian couples as well. It's about at the heterosexual level, um, but about one out of three of, of gay couples uh, engage in these polyandrous, uh, uh, you know, the, the, these uh, kind of simultaneous uh, sexual relationships. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do you think that it could grow that percentage in the future or, or not? Um, probably not, given that, you know, the, the majority of the population is heterosexual and it's uncommon in that group. And so prob probably I, I, I doubt it's going to get much 
more than it is now. I mean, maybe among young couples before they get married because they're kind of exploring and stuff and figuring out what they want to do in the long term, you know, maybe there. But I think once people settle down, it won't, it won't be very common. Mm -hmm. So I have just one last topic that I would like to explore. Sure. Uh, that is one that you leave out of the book. Uh, mm -hmm. In the book, you say that uh, you're not interested in exploring the politics of gender. Uh, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, because it's a big area and, um, uh, you know, I only had so many pages to do. My, my editor said, you know, basically you have a thousand manuscript pages. Uh, and actually went to 1,050 or so, and just covering the sex differences is a lot. Um, and, and plus, you can kind of get caught up in the politics of it. So there's a lot of gender activists who um, willfully and, and don't want to believe that there are any inherent biologically based sex differences um, at all. And they're very dedicated to suppressing any type of information that might uh, you know, provide evidence that there are, in fact, differences. And some of the differences we see in the modern world actually have a biological basis to them. They're not socially constructed. So, so they're very intensely wedded to that social construction belief. Um, and they react very aggressively sometimes to suppressing any information that goes against that belief. Um, and, and that's not science, that's self-serving politics. And I just didn't want to spend time on that. Uh, my feeling was that, well, if I just laid out the sex differences beginning from sexual, the evolution of sexual reproduction, you know, spend 30% of the book just on non-human species to kind of get the basics down and then just you know, exhaustively cover sex differences in all sorts of areas, uh, cultural variation in them as well as universals. Um, I think that makes the point that, you know, the biology and evolution cannot be ignored when we're studying sex differences. Now, I could make a verbal argument for it, but I think presenting all of this evidence and documentation um, does a better job of that. Mm -hmm. But we talked about things like education, professional <clears throat> occupations, and so on. Do you think that uh, this knowledge can inform some policies or politicians, uh, I mean, their decisions? Um, or do you think that this science should be completely left out of politics? Well, um... I think it does it does have something to say about policies. So there are um, some countries, some of the Nordic countries are trying to actively eliminate um, any sex differences. And um, one way they're doing that is they're trying to disrupt, as they call it, um, sex typical play behaviors. Um, so they want boys to engage in girl typical play and girls to engage in boy typical play and that goes along with their beliefs that it's all socialization and so forth and you disrupt it there and create gender neutral or gender whatever um, play patterns that don't differ for boys and girls that when they become adults they're, they'll be behaviorally, socially, psychologically indistinguishable so we'll no longer see any any sex differences um, in society. And so there are um, interventions, um, lots of policies centered on getting teachers to disrupt these patterns and to intervene, not allow boys to engage in boy typical play or girls to engage in girl typical play or to intervene to get them to play, girls to play rough and tumble types of things, for example, whether or not they want to. Um, and, and I think those things are, well, one, or one, a waste of money and effort. You know, it's a social engineering sort of thing. And, and it's probably very stressful for kids who would prefer not to do these things. Uh, probably for teachers, too, who are basically 
mandated to change human nature. I mean, it's a, um, it, 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 it's a, it's a failing enterprise, but a lot of effort and money are being kind of wasted in my, in my view on these, on these types of interventions. Mm -hmm. But the science should not be prescriptive. I mean, in terms of telling people, because I mean, it's a very delicate subject, but uh, because uh, we have these universal sex differences that are that have a biological basis to them sometimes mm -hmm. at least for some people it feels like we are sort of trying to tell men and women that they should behave in these uh, sexually dimorphic ways let's say mm -hmm. so what do you think about that well, I, I don't think it's prescriptive at all. I mean, it, it's prescriptive from the activist socialization point of view because they want to change the ways the policies are based on changing sex typical patterns of, in this case, play behavior. Um, so that's that's the intervention from an evolutionary perspective and from my personal perspective. I'd say, well, you know, kids are going to do what they're going to do. Um, they are going to find certain activities more interesting than others, and they're going to develop certain types of relationships and not other types of relationships. And so you should just let them do that. Don't enforce anything. Just let them be kids. And if you let them be kids, they're going to, uh, you know, sex differences are going to express themselves. So from my perspective, the evolutionary approach, I'm saying, well, don't intervene and try to change these things. One, because it's probably stressful on kids, and two, well, it's not going to be helpful um, in in the long run. So the prescriptions are coming from the other side, not not from the evolutionary side. Now, now they are, they're arguing that that reinforces stereotypes and so forth, and. You can tell kids, well, you know, girls can do this. Girls can engage in rough and tumble play. Boys can play with dolls and so forth. So you can change the narrative. And some parents do that. Um, and, and there's studies of kids who grew up in families where the parents are kind of gender equal in terms of what they give them toys and what they say and so forth and more traditional. And the boys and girls' beliefs differ. If you ask a boy and raised in a kind of egalitarian household, can girls play with trucks and army men and so forth? Sure. Can boys play with dolls and stuff? Sure. So their beliefs are, are more equal. But when you actually cut them loose to play, um, they're not any different from other kids. They still engage in the sex typical types of play. So it, it, it's very difficult to get rid of it. Um, and I'm not sure um, it, it's a good idea to kind of force kids to do things that they really don't want to do, but especially, well, unless they, they need, need to learn how to read and write and so forth. And they might not like that, but, you know, forcing, you know, three-year-old girls to engage in rough and tumble play is just, I don't see the point. Yeah. Okay. So let's end on that note. And guys, again, the book is Male, Female, The Evolution of Human Sex Differences and Dr. Geary. It, it has been a pleasure to talk to you again. Great, great. Uh, Ricardo, thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel back in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with top academics and scholars from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please pay a visit to my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you prefer PayPal, I also have links to that in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please leave a like, share it and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett Perga Larsen. Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Kessel, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Anian Kata, Jacob Klinkby, 
Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Henry Kalenius, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Kintis, Ruth Gervoz, Bo Weingarten, Rebecca Neuberger Goldstein, Dan Demetrio, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Thomas Trumbull, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormer, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Yugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Omari Hickson, Fergal Cusson, Evan Bodrenko, Hal Herzog, Nuno Machado, Don Ross, João Alves da Silva, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hummel, David Sloan Wilson, Yassi Ladeza Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dmitry Grigoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, and Yannick Punter, my producers, is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Sergio Codriano, Luis Caetano, Matthew Lavender, Tom Vanegdam, Curtis Dixon, João Linhares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis France, and Niruban Balachandran, and my executive producers, Michel Rujewski, Rosie, and James Pratt. Thank you for all.